here because uh, I have a long relationship with NAM. I've been speaking here for uh, actually the winter NAM show mainly, but for uh, probably the last eight years. Uh, on everything from artist relations to producing, mixing, engineering. Uh, I used to handle artist relations for Avid and Pro Tools, which put me in, in kind of a prime position to, to learn a lot about what these professionals do for a living. And so uh, I think David thought I would be the right person to, to bring out some um, amazing golden nuggets here for you today. And um, I wanted to just let them introduce themselves briefly, and then I'll just start in with some questions that I have put together, and then I'll open it up so that you guys have a chance to ask some questions as well. So I want to start by welcoming Jeffrey Steele. Uh, Jeffrey Steele, thank you. I'm a world famous songwriter, which means you guys have no idea who I am. So, uh, uh, and I love writing songs. I love writing songs. I'm a singer, uh, musician also. Uh, came to Nashville in 1993. Started coming out to Nashville in 1987. Uh, um, um, actually, a year after Tony Brown cut one of my songs, I decided to go check out Nashville. I guess that turns it over to you, Tony. That is Jeffrey Steele. He's the reason I have a gig <laughs> and I have a house. Uh, I'm, my name is Tony Brown. I'm a producer. I worked for Universal for 30 years as A&R and ended up becoming president and produced a lot of records at MCA. I am now an independent producer kind of feel like I'm starting over again and uh, it's such a young man's world I'm finding out that experience is not a calling card it's just something that you pull out of your toolbox when you need it and uh, but it was more fun trying to make a, a success in this business than it is trying to sustain it trust me So Andrew, have you had a chance to work with these guys? Uh, yeah, actually, well, half the time I don't even know who wrote the songs that uh, that I'm mastering, but um, but I've definitely worked with Tony before, and I, and I and I know I've worked with Jeffrey. I'm just not sure sometimes which songs are his. Usually the good ones, I think, though. Um, but my name is Andrew Mendelson. I am the owner and chief mastering engineer at Georgetown Masters here in Nashville. Came down here in 2002, and uh, was brought down by my old mentor, Danny Purcell and uh, acquired the company in 2004 and fortunately still working today. Fantastic. I'm glad that you guys know each other and work together. I think that'll, that'll add a lot of chemistry to the panel today. So when David contacted me, he was the one that had the idea for, for the topic here. And I said, well, you know, I guess there's a bit of controversy around whether you can actually craft a hit. Is it something that there's a formula for? Is there something that you can actually you know, do to ensure a hit. And so I didn't know if there was going to be enough content for the panel. And then as we got to talking, I realized, wow, there's actually a lot to talk about today. So I'm going to start with that controversial question to these guys. Can you actually engineer, craft, um, you know, consciously create a hit? Absolutely. Uh, it happens every day. And I think um, being, a, being a songwriter, like when you get to a place like Nashville, that's what you focus on is your craft, you, you, how, how, your bag of tricks, how to do what you do, you know, how to, how to bring out what, what your, uh, your talents are best with the other people that you're around in the room. Um, it's absolutely possible. At most of the songs on the charts are crafted songs, but I think the trick is, I've always, you know, I teach a, teach a songwriting school and I have a, a lot of writers that I develop and publishing companies and I, I try to tell everybody that, um, you 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 want to learn the craft as great as you can learn the craft and you want to craft songs every day all day long but the whole point of doing that is to finally get to the point where god speaks to you and something really insanely wonderful comes through and that craft allows you just to let that song come through and and be what it needs to be does, does that make sense and more in your subconscious but you learn that craft for that for those rare 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 moments when that really special idea comes through and you know exactly how to carry that thing across the finish line because you've been crafting for years and the, the, the backside is that is all that crafting may have got you a lot of hits on the side also that have done very well for you but but I think it's those rare songs that we're all trying to get that that last a lifetime and I always find that um, the craft has helped me help me just walk my way there without going okay what do I do now how, What's my second verse going to be? How, how do I get, you know, what do I do? do? Is there a bridge or is there no bridge? You know, 
crafting allows you to do that when that really great idea comes through. That's my opinion. Interesting. And Tony, do you think that it's always the goal to create a, a hit? I, I think so. I mean, actually, a singer-songwriter usually is, is about the art. And you know, like a, a Mellencamp or Steve Earle, even a Lyle Lovett, in the beginning, like Lyle Lovett's first album was, we had three top 10 records and it made him famous, it gave him a platform. Hits give you a platform for somebody to say, what else you got? And uh, when I worked at a record company, an artist would come in and say, hey, I'm sorry to tell you, I don't write. And I would go, thank God I get a Jeffrey Steele song or a Gary Burr song. Otherwise, you gotta sit through their 30 songs and there's not one there and you have to t let them down that there's no, radio songs here and then of course some hate the, the the word the c word commercial it's all about art no it's about you, you your hit gives you a platform for people to get into your writing that's what you got you into elton john and jackson brown even the beatles are the best example those guys were not a rock band they were a pop band that wrote the greatest songs of all time and, uh, and then, you know, there's hits used to, I remember when I got into the business in 69, the rule was Owen Bradley said you had to get to the hook in 20 seconds. Used to the hook was the chorus. I mean, everybody can sing the chorus of a lot of songs. They don't know the lyrics or the melody to the verse. Hound Dog, you know, Yellow Submarine, You Got a Friend, Desperado. But sometimes, the hook can be the intro, it can be the vibe, it can be the first line. It can be just the premise of the song, like the dance. My God, I just divorced my last wife twice. I could have missed the pain, but I would have missed the dance. Oh God, that's my song right there. <laughs> uh, so actually a hit gives you a platform. I think everybody aspires to have a hit because it, it makes people go, who is that? and what else do they have? And then you gotta follow a hit with a hit. And you can be, at first, you can be simple, but then eventually you gotta get some depth in your songwriting. And at record companies, they usually want an up-tempo as your first hit. That used to be my biggest gripe, I would say. So you prefer a mediocre up-tempo to a fabulous ballad. And the promotion department would say, yes. So if, as a producer, if you want to be, you want a platform too, you need a few hits in your back pocket, find an up-tempo so you can get to that ballad. You know, the producer gets the, gets the privilege of working with the artists if they write their own songs. Like, for instance, Vince Skill, Steve Earle, Lyle Lovett, Nancy Griffith wrote all their songs. And sometimes they don't even know their songs are hits. When I cut, when I, I still believe in you on Vince Gill, he'd only written a verse and a chorus. And he'd played me 43 songs top to bottom, and all of his songs are five minutes long. And so I said, let's cut that. He said, it's not finished. I said, it's a hit. Sing the first verse twice, and you can finish the song after we cut it. And he did, and it became Song of the Year, Single of the Year. Because when I heard that song, the first line was, everybody wants a little piece of my time. Still, I'll put you at the end of the line. His voice, that first line, the melody, and the vibe of that song was the hook. You were like completely pulled in. And um, that's my take on hits. You gotta have hits to have a platform and to have a career. But the, the secret is to do it over and over and over again. If you only do it once, uh, I saw a girl play a show not too long ago and there was this song I heard on Lightning 100, which plays AAA music, which is not necessarily mainstream hits. And she sang this song that I loved, and I went, oh, that's who did that. <laughs> and I still don't remember her name. But it was the song. The song is the, the key thing. It's not your voice. It's the song. And the producer's job is not to mess it up. And the mixer's job, the mastering guy's job, it's just to make it louder. <laughs> okay. That's Thank all you. you do, Andrew, right? You just make it louder. That's all good for. That's all good for. <laughs>
<laughs> so Andrew's representing kind of the, the technical aspects today for the panel, uh, mixing, mastering, engineering, and, and having an, an insight into that. So how much of the technical side of the business is responsible for hit making, in your opinion? I mean, it, it, whoa. at the end of the day, I mean, it's, you're talking about a, a song, you know, and it's really our job just to present that song. You know, you, you have a great song, you, you try and get a great performance on it. And, it. and, you know, producers and, I mean, the producers maybe even charged of finding that song, but the engineers and, and all of us are really finding a way to present that in the best light you know, and, and, and sort of stay out of the way. And each successive stage will try and maybe remove a barrier between the listener and that song and that performance. So if, you know, you have a great mix, you know, the best thing I can hope to do is just maybe take one layer, one filter away that, that, that stops you from, stops the listener from engaging that, that song. Um, that, that's what we're here for. We're here to stay out of the way as best as possible and present what, what he does in, in the best light. So what's an example of a filter that you would remove that you think would do that? Like, how do you know that's there? I, um, if something is, maybe isn't having, like on the mastering end, like if something isn't having as much impact as it should, or if maybe if the vocal is buried, or we, we were just talking about, okay, maybe the vocal is just kind of, you, know, you just do a vocal up mix and try and bring that forward. Something that's, it's preventing the emotion of the song from coming through. You know, I, there's a song that's on the charts right now that I did where, um, uh, the mix was, uh, you know, fabulous mix engineer, but he was in a new room and it was just very closed in, and, and it just the song didn't reach out and grab you. And I feel like once we were done, it just it pres was presented in a better light, and, and all of a sudden, like you can now just you could just vibe on that song. You weren't you weren't kind of like straining to hear it. It just sort of reached out and grabbed you in a better way. Yeah. So David told me earlier that Phil Ramone once said that the way he identifies whether there's a hit is to see how many asses are shaking in the room. <laughs> Do you guys agree? How many butts are moving when, when you put, put it on the studio? So the butt shaking uh, technique, part of crafting a record. Um, so would you agree with that? Do you guys play your music for friends when it, when it's in the early stages to see kind of how they resonate with it, or do you keep a pretty private uh, process? Well, I always had this uh, this uh, uh, whenever I play a gig, I always tell this on stage. Um, when I when I first came to Nashville, I was kind of I came from a world of like '70s rock and roll and real hardcore country, and so I was mixing the two together, you know, and I was making my stew of of what my music was going to be. So when I got to Nashville in the early 90s and I was playing my stuff around, everybody would laugh at me and tell me that it was terrible and to get out, you know, I need to go back to L.A. because this stuff sucks and it's never going to get played on radio. And, and then I'd go play a gig with my band and all the pretty girls would come up to the stage and say, man, I love that song, What Hurts the Most. Can you play that one again? But then I'd go play it for the record company people and they go, nobody wants to hear a five-minute ballad that's depressing. And so I, at some point in my head, I started my own research and development company on stage and I said, well, either the record companies are wrong or the girls are wrong. And the girls are never wrong when it comes to music. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's proven me right every single time. So when I go out and play a, a show and girls react and they come up and they go, man, that song, and they're, they're crying or they're laughing, um, I go, okay, I got something here. I, got, I don't care what anybody tells me. I know I got something. And, and the business has also taught me that in my case, I don't know about everybody's case, but in my case, sometimes it's taken 8, 9, 10, 13 years for a song to get cut and go to the top of the charts for somebody to find it or for somebody to believe in it. Um, that's just kind of the nature, I think, of what I was doing musically at that time. It wasn't really accepted, so I had, I had to keep refining and, and, and believing in what I was doing more than anything. That's an interesting perspective because it seems like there's a lot of people that'll give you different information and at some point you have to trust in your own instincts and your own you know, reactions and, and I guess the people in your inner circle that you really can trust that have been there for you. Would you yeah, agree with without, that? Yeah, without question. And, and, that, and that would be my, that was really my inner circle. I mean, of course you ask your friends and stuff and, and, you, and you try to feel it when you're in the studio and you, you can get a sense in the studio when everybody's reacting and I mean, right? You kind of everybody kind of knows when the, yeah, yeah. it's like, oh my God, this is something. But but when you play it live, and nobody's heard it before, and they immediately react to it, you go, okay, okay, I'm onto it. You know? yeah. <laughs> so that's been my, it's been my gauge, I think, that's for fantastic. me. Yeah. Yeah. 
cool. So um, it's, I guess one of the things we were talking about is uh, new technology and whether there there's a a, a lot of well, for example, with plugins and the and Andrew, this is a little bit targeted at you, um, with plugin technology and different things. Can can there be a future in you know having some of the technology dictate whether hits are made, like at certain levels and things that are found to to be uh, popular over and over? Like a, a plugin that could find a hit. Well, can, almost like AI, you know, can suggest Cause, cause things. Because then he's out of a job. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> a producer plug-in. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, I guess the, the question is that um, I'm, what I'm getting at is that there are formula, okay? So from a technical standpoint, there may be certain levels, certain, you know, ways that you, you affect things that you're, you're finding almost like can be templatized in a sense. Is, is there a formula? Um, wow. I mean, I think... One, that would actually, once again, I'd have to revert that back to a, to the songwriter because, yeah, there could be a, a formula to the way the song is is, is stacked. And uh, we were talking earlier about you know um, track guys, you know, who like to build build out out of essentially out of the demo. So yeah, they can um, essentially create the entire production in their bedroom. Um, uh, look at uh, Sam Hunt's body like a background. I mean, it's essentially not not much more than what the demo was, and I think it's the longest running number one in country chart history. Um, so certainly the the barrier of entry has certainly changed to where maybe 30 years ago you needed a uh, the finances of a record label and you needed to uh, have a, a full on studio to go in and, and make a great record. Um, I mean, there's some exceptions to the rule, but for the, like, the Springsteen's Nebraska or somebody that was recorded on four track, but for the most part, you know, you needed that that infrastructure. Now, I mean, a lot of these hits are created by one person on a computer, um, and and so yes, it can be done. At the end of the day, it comes down to the talent of the person doing it. At the end of the day, you have to have a great song, you have to have a great person performing it, and once again, the rest of us are just sort of here to take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. So Tony, I'm curious about when you are working with an artist and you have a very clear idea about how the song needs to change, you know, like what you were just mentioning about, you know, putting the, the hook up front and cutting it and making it shorter and stuff. Uh, what, how, how much influence do you have in making those changes and how do you work with an artist to adopt some of those changes? I mean, are some of them very attached to their, their art and their ideas, or, you know, or by bringing you on by nature, they're trusting you. Like, what do you have to do to get it to the point where you can influence that and, and support an artist in that way? Well, can you guys hear us up here? Okay. Um, I approach it different ways. Like with Alain Lovett, his first record that I did with him were his demos. I mean, they were cut in Arizona on a 16 track with his band. And so when we signed him to MCA, Jimmy Bowen, had me send him around to all the producers that were really successful at the time, like David Hungate, Barry Beckett, James Stroud, uh, Byron Gallimore, I think, Bob Montgomery, whoever was producing records back in those days. And his record was so complex, had horn sections, a black chick singing cool stuff. I said, man, if, if it was me, I would just put this out as your record. I mean, this is your album. And he said, would you do that? I said, absolutely. Is it on 16 track? Give me the, give me the safety, the master, and let me remix it. We'll fix anything that's wrong with like a, a messed up guitar part or we'll what, add something here or there. And it, it had three hits on him and it made him an artist. And people would say, you did that first Lyle Lovett record. Man, you're a genius, I'd say. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, why should I go in and explain to them how I came to that? You know, I think I, this town, uh, when I work with a singer-songwriter, they usually have a direction, an arrangement they want. An artist like George Strait, Reba, who don't write their songs, I get a rhythm section and we get the demos and a lot of time, the, depending on the demos, if it's Jeff Steele or uh, Jeff Stevens, uh, just certain people in town who just cut great demos, they've already given you the, the sketch of what the song should sound like and I'll, I'll follow that. I may change it around just a little bit, but I take that as, as what they want it to sound like. Uh, 
And then I, sometimes I get guitar vocals, like by Stephanie Smith. She just plays the guitar herself, and I can hear the band playing through the way she's playing. She's trying to, she's trying to play the drum beat and the, the little hook in the, in the chorus. So I can, I can find the song myself through a guitar vocal, or I copy a demo if it's dead on. Why would I not? It's not plagiarizing. It's basically I'm going, that's the way they want, want to hear it. Uh, and then I, Jimmy Bowen always taught me, he said, just remember, it's the artist's record. It's not your record. So I always ask the artist to give me advice on the way it should sound. But otherwise, I step in when needed and stay out of the way when needed. And it's always worked for me. I, mean, I, 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 love, I love the fact of casting bands for different artists. Like, you know, I cast in the rhythm section for George. It's different than casting one for, say, Lyle. Well, Lyle uses his own band. But I love that. This track thing, I've got to find a way to fit in. So I just found me a new guy. I started going, I need to find me a, a co-worker, a co-producer that can do the track thing, because I don't do that. And I found a guy who worked with uh, Jeff on a band he's in called the Sons of the Palomino. And he cuts records as good as my Brooks and Dunn records and my George Strait records and my Vince Gill records. And then he also cuts stuff that sound like Charlie Puth. He does a track thing too. I said, that's my guy. So, no, so by, excuse me, by track thing, are you talking about tracking and, track, tracking no, and engineering? I, I, we call track guy is the guy that, where I have to have a rhythm section and an engineer and a, a musicians. These guys like Busby, uh, Shane McAnally, Ross Copperman, the tr they're called track guys. They're the ones that work with a loop, then they play the guitar parts, they co-write the songs with the artists, they sing the backgrounds usually, and and if they, if they think that their track needs a drum, they'll lay a drum over on top of the loop. But they're called track guys because there's no outsiders involved, which affects me because I don't do that. So I need someone who does, you know, music is becoming genreless. If you notice, hip hop is influencing this bro country and country music as such. And I've been trying to analyze what is that hip hop influence. It's the kick drum. You know, in country music, the kick drum is the one and the three. In hip hop, it's like really sporadic. And I don't hear those things, but Brandon Hood does, so. I'll have to say, man, you, you're in charge of the, the, the loop or whatever. Uh, so I'm trying to find a way to fit into this new world, too. I, I want to grow. But not everybody, not all these track guys could get a good guitar, both acoustic guitar sound on uh, Randy Scruggs because they don't know how to do that. They don't know about microphones and all this kind of stuff. So we're all learning. We all need each other. Brandon needs me for contacts. I need him because he understands what I used to do, and I, under, I, I understand that he knows what's happening right now, so we need each other. So I'm just trying to stay relevant, and part of that is songwriters that are, songwriters like Jeff and, and Gary Burr are sitting in the audience. I'm not blowing smoke up his butt, <laughs> but these guys know how to stay relevant. They draw from tradition. They are not necessarily retro, but they can go there and pull ideas. But you've got to stay on top of what's happening in pop music today. And just remember, the word pop music is not a genre. It stands for popular music. And that's music that appeals to everybody. And uh, I just, I'm trying to stay involved in all of that and pay attention. I'm, I'm listening to music again now for pleasure. And also, I'm analyzing it, and I'm researching it, going, how do I fit into today's music? Because as you see, I'm 71 years old, but I try to feel like I'm like 47. I'm forever an adolescent. And, uh, and people say, well, you should dress your age. I go, kiss my ass. <laughs> Thank you very much. I agree. 
maybe it'd be helpful for everybody to understand, you know, the actual hit maker team. What are the roles uh, on the team? And so I know that budgets are limited these days and how many people are involved affect the budget. So can one of you guys chime in and talk about who, who all the necessary players are to in the process? Obviously, starting with the songwriter, as right? Far, as far as creating the whole mm. hit record? Yep. I mean, of course, you got at the top of the thing, the record company and the, and the distribution chain and the promoters and all. You still have to have all that. It's all very important although there's a lot of great self-promoting going on and we have all these platforms now, obviously, uh, to launch records and that's it worked for a lot of people. Um, but at the beginning, I still think um, whether you're working with a track guy or you're doing it old school, you still have to have a great group of guys that are building that track or uh, they have great talents at lyric writing, they're top liners. Um, and, and you want to be with people that you mesh with. And, and I think these days you can, you can have really nothing you can have a nice little track program with a great vocal on it that ends up with andrew getting mastered because coming out as a single or you can still go the old route and you have the whole band in there and uh which i still have a, a passion for because i still love going in with all these great musicians especially here in nashville there's so many great musicians you, you take that you take that song which is a live thing you take it into the room and the band hears it for the first time and they're their wheels are turning and, and all of a sudden there's all these hooks and ideas coming that you wouldn't have thought of. And and a little case in point um, just of a song, uh, like a journey of mine. I, I wrote the song What Hurts the Most for Rascal Flats. I wrote it years and years ago, but um, I had this title um, called What Means the Most. That was my title and we, we had the track being built and I was listening to the track and, and um, as I was listening to parts of the music into the track, I, in the middle of the song, I came up with the first idea for the song and started writing it. And then that, that led me to the chorus, which was what means the most, which took me back to the verse, and I wrote both of the verses. And so, you know, we're, we're all sitting there and we're all working on it. And then, and then I go into the vocal booth to, to sing the, the vocal. And as I'm singing the vocal, I accidentally sa sung what hurts the most. And I stopped the engineer and I said, wait a minute, I sang that wrong. And then, and then the guy that I was writing was Steve Robson said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, come, come in here, come in here, listen to this. And we listened to it, and that mistake ended up being a multi-million dollar, <laughs> multi-million dollar mistake. Excellent. But that's why all the players are so important, because if you don't listen to those things, and you think you're the guy and you're doing the thing, you're going to overlook all that stuff. I could have easily said, you know, I, I wrote the lyric, don't tell me what to sing. But you got to be smart enough to go, hey, Oh, let me, let me go listen to this, and it ended up being right. So, you know, I just wanted to interject all, that. All the roles are always there. It's just a matter of do you need different people to do them, or are you going to try and do them all yourself? Like, each step has to happen. It's different, like, difference between being part of a band or being a solo act. Uh, do you want that collaborative effort, or do you want to take it all on yourself? There's a lot of great mix engineers that could probably master their own record. Well, Hopefully, I'm going to do it better, and I'm going to bring some, into the, some sort of perspective to them that, that, that sort of second, I see my job as the editorial stage. It's like, hopefully what you're gonna give me, you know, if you were writing a book, you, you know, you're gonna bring it to me, it's like, hey, it's great. Sometimes you might say, hey, change this one word. Sometimes you might say, hey, let's re rewrite chapter three. You know, so it's, it's all about, you know, do you need that collaboration or do you want that collaboration on any particular song? The roles will always happen, it's just whether you need help doing it. And it's easier to do it on your own now if you didn't want to go down that path. Uh, certainly, I think a lot of people want to feel empowered to being to not necessarily need. I mean, they would love to have a dream team, but not but, everybody. But, has. That, but that's dangerous. In, in which case, you wouldn't have that magical moment that he had when writing that song. If you don't have that those other other perspectives, sometimes you miss out. Yeah. That collaboration is important. Do you find that you start to work with the same people over and over because you just know what they offer and you can trust them I, in the process? I think you get your crew. You got you kind of get your peeps. Like, I w when I first came to town, I was riding with everybody that would write with me. And, and a lot of guys are like, well, I don't want to give away my good ideas. I'm like, man, give them, you're going to write, you're going to write every song you wrote, you're going to write 50 more times a different way. Uh, it's going to, everything's going to fall a different way. So I just wanted to write, I'd write three times a day. And then I, eventually I got to where I met four, five, six guys that I really gelled with. Um, whether it was uh, at the time, whether it was Craig Wiseman or Bob DePiro or, uh, uh, Chris Wallen or uh, Anthony Smith. There were so many back at, at when I first came here. And then as I evolved, I started having some success um, and started getting older. 
I wanted to get I wanted to write with the young guys. I want I don't want to write my story anymore. I want to help them write their story. You know what I mean? So so you have to evolve but but I think the crew having the having the crew around you and constantly evolving. It, Tony just tapped on that and I think it's it's so crucial to keep evolving too as you go on to keep relevant, you know, to keep to keep in it to keep cuz you love doing it, you know. So what advice would you give to people who want to work with, you know, people like you but maybe don't feel like they're successful enough yet to to work on this level? I mean, how approachable are you guys? I'll find you. You know what I mean? Don't worry about it. I'll find you. <laughs> well, I did talk to somebody who won a Grammy and they said that, you know, actually it was harder for their career afterwards because they people had this impression that they weren't approachable, that they were too it's, expensive. It's true. So I'm curious, how, so right, are people, you still getting the call? Yeah, they put a thing on you and they think like, well, I'm not gonna be able to write. It's like, no, 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 if I hear about you and you're great, there's a couple guys right now, this young kid named Steven Wilson that is just absolutely fantastic. So I, I, I'm running to him, you know what I mean? I, I, and I've always been that way, even when I was first starting out and having success, I was like, I want to find these guys because I want to gel with these guys, you know? Well, what gets your attention? Um, it's just something they do. Like, you see them play live, and it's something they do that just lights a fire. I mean, right? I mean, you just, you just go, God, I love what he does. I, I want to know about what he does. You like know what I mean? Like your new sub guitar player that you have now that I just Saul. went. Oh, Saul. man. <laughs> Who, Who is, is this that? guy? Exactly. Well, you just get so intrigued by it. You want to you want to be a part of it. Like, I want to go meet that guy and see if I can work with him. And how would they best approach you if it was the other way around? Um, I, I, people usually come to see me at shows and they'll come up to me and say, I, I'd sure love to write a song with you. And I'm like, oh, okay. Because, um, um, you know, I'm writing a lot and I'm doing a lot of things and I'm booked. But, but I'll listen to their stuff and see what they're all about. Or I might even come check them out. Or my daughter that works with me, Casey, she'll, she might go out and see a show and, and, and go, you need to write with that guy or that girl. You, know, you need to do it now. You know? <laughs> or I might sign them to a publishing deal. When I was in college, I interned at Sony Music Studios up in New York City. And I think I was the first intern to ever ask to work in the mastering department. And so they didn't really know what to do with me. So the, the first week or two, I would just sit on the booker's couch. And it's like, do you have anything for me to do? No, you have nothing for me to do. So I would just sit there. And then one day, uh, Mark Wilder, one of the master engineers, came in and said, well, what do you want to do for a living? And I'm like, I kind of want to do what you do. He's like, really? I wouldn't know. And I'm like, well, I just didn't want to get in the way. He's like, well, I'm not going to ask you to come sit in, but you know, if you ask me, you know, maybe you can sit in. I don't know. It's, and it really was an eye-opening thing because I, I was so timid. I didn't, didn't really want to step on anybody's toes or you know, be seen as that, like, oh, this intern that thinks he knows everything. But you know, you have to put yourself out there. You have to sort of you know go out and, 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 and knock on some doors and be and, and so then I started saying, Hey, can I sit in? And most of the time you say no, but once in a while it's like, Oh yeah, I got no nobody coming in, go ahead and then I'd start hanging out in his room and and uh, after hours after he got to trust me. So it's sort of like just you know, putting yourself out there and trying to, to meet people and make those relationships. Just, yeah, that's just don't a be good timid point. about it. Can I touch on that real yeah. quick too? Um when I when I first came here, I was in a band, had a record deal lost the record deal and I was basically on the streets again as a musician, a working musician, you know, trying to get a publishing deal as a writer. I was back in the, you know, back at square one. And so I went back being a musician, I went back to doing what I knew how to do, which was sing demos. So I started singing demos for songwriters. Um, and then and, and I'd, I'd ask them, I'd say, hey, can I write a song with you? And they're like, dude, just shut up and sing the song. <laughs> but occasionally there would be one and like Bob DePiro, Back in the day, was one of those guys that said, "Hey, come on, I'll write a song with you." And I, and and, and I was so taken by that. When I got with them that day, we ended up writing a song for Montgomery Gentry that was a massive hit for them called "Gone." Um, that day, because um, I, I was so lit up to write with him, and I, I was so honored that he gave me that opportunity. So I just wanted to stretch on what you were doing too. Like, you gotta, you just keep doing what you do, you know, and and. Keep going back to your sources of what you know how to do, and keep making those contacts. Ask people; they're going to they're gonna slam the door in your face. I've slammed the door in people's faces, and 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 it, it was a stupid thing for me to do because they went on to become really big. I didn't mean to; I just probably was really busy and was overwhelmed. Um, and then there was times when I didn't. I remember back in the day, people there was uh, there was people coming up to me saying, "Hey, you want to write with this 13-year-old girl named Taylor Swift?" 
she can only write after school. Like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Do you know what I mean? So, so you, you, every opportunity is an opportunity. Most people that have success in this business have it because they're passionate about it. If you bring passion to the table and you, yeah. and, and you exert passion, people are going to naturally respond to that. People, like, people do this because they love music. They want to, if you bring passion for music to the table, they're going to want to hang out with you. They're going to want to you know, work with you. Yeah, you know, one of my past panelists is a, uh, a very well-known mixer named Tony Maserati, and he has, um, and he basically brings on a lot of interns and assistant engineers, and he has what's called a 10-minute rule, which is basically an opportunity where he gives one of his assistants the hot seat and is able to, to try their hand at mixing and seeing what they come up with, and it's, it's, he said he's learned so much for himself about the process because of the fact that what they come up with is, is it can be very fresh and different. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you know, he does bring on interns, he does, you know, offer them the opportunity to do what he does occasionally, and I know that there's those opportunities out there and I'm just uh, bringing that up because, you know, the number of times that I've hosted these panels, one of the common questions is how do I break in? You know, how do you get to the level of working with someone, you know, of these the caliber of these guys? And so you find those people who do have those opportunities, and it, and the approach is also very important. Obviously, if if you're, you know, you, what I usually recommend is to come at them with how you can help them. Uh, most people will, you know, be looking at, well, how can they help me? And if you, you know, if you can say, look, I have these skills, or you know, I can contribute in this way, or I can save time for you, or you know, come up with some some original things that can really support them in the process. They're going to be open, and then you'll have your chance to contribute and be able to offer a lot more value over time, and have those opportunities yeah. to shine. So um, definitely the approach coming from the how can I support you, you know, could help break in as well. And find out if they have any established opportunities like an internship program. Some are paid, some are free, but you know, you can you can do it for a, a limited period of time to show your worth and those things can turn into full full blown opportunities. Can I do a quick touch on yeah. that one more time too? Absolutely. I was just gonna say too, like as far as your skills go, um, back in the, this is back in the day because I'm an older guy, but um, I was singing demos uh, for everybody, uh, especially in Los Angeles, because nobody could sing country music, so I'd get all the work. Um, but back in the day, when it was 24 track uh, or 16 track, I, I, I would um, I would make sure that I could I could sing the lead vocal and both harmony parts uh, and double them within an hour, hour and a half. I, I mastered it. I became so good at that, and, and I really wanted to write songs, you know, and be an artist and do that. But I kept just honing that skill because I had a knack to be able to do it. So it always got me in these doors where I was working with all these people, one of them being Steve Dorff um, back in Los Angeles. Steve Dorff ended getting me in the, up in the Pure Country movie with George Strait, um, which, end, which ended getting me a video, a video thing with my record company in Texas. All these things happened around relationships I made through singing those demos that got me into these songwriting camps that ended up getting me a record deal here or a situation there it just so i always say like find make yourself invaluable whatever your skill is you got to make yourself invaluable where they need you in that room with them and they're like hey, they're gonna like call jeff jeff can do that in an hour and a half he can do three of them a day and i wore myself out but i could do it you know and and i was making a little bit of money but i was making a lot of contacts which got me here to nashville and and uh and same thing continued on from there so do you find that working in, in different cities like LA, Nashville, you know, New York, Atlanta, some of these hot spots, Chicago, have very different cultures and vibes and, and you have to find where you fit in or do you feel like you can work with anyone anywhere? I'll let someone else end. I, I will say I, I think it used to, but not so much anymore. I think it's it's blended a lot now, but I'll turn that over to you. I mean one, 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 one. Hello, hello. Um, I think for me I haven't had to work if I worked in L.A. or in Atlanta, it was always working with Kenny Rogers in Atlanta to do a vocal or with Reba in Los Angeles to do, when I was doing a duet record, cutting with musicians out there. So my work is mainly here in Nashville. But I do want to tell a story about now that it's such a young man's world, I'm not working as much as I was. I used to do 13 albums a year. I did 19 records with George Strait. And now I'm not doing him anymore. I got stopped the other night in Publix parking lot. Some guy screamed across the parking lot and said, hey, man, you're Tony Brown. I said, I am. 
He said, can I tell you something? I said, sure, man. He said, back, back in the day, man, you were really good. <laughs> I said, man, I appreciate that. He said, I mean it. Back in the day, I said, that's why I'm rich. <laughs> I didn't say that. I, I, I took it as a compliment. But, you know, a, a publisher about six years ago uh, had me come to his office to play a song for Ronnie Dunn. And while he was there, he played me a girl he had signed and played me three songs by her. And I thought the songs were hits and the demos were awesome. He said, go cut these three songs on her, re-demo re them, and you can pitch her as, a, as an artist. I said, no, give me those hard drives. Those demos are perfect. So I went and spent 20 grand remixing uh, on an analog board because they've been mixing the box and they sounded great. But I, I went to Clark Slicer at Warner Brothers Publishing and remixed those songs and and added a few things and didn't get a deal with her. And she she said, "I'm I'm so sorry you spent your money on this." I said, "No." I did that for me, not for you. I wanted to see if I still had a set of balls or not. <laughs> see, if, see if I was any good. And I said, I did that for you. And actually, one of the songs just got cut uh, by Zach Brown on some artists he's producing. And she thanked me for it. And I was going, you know, as I was doing those, mixing those, I started asking, who's playing on this? And I didn't know a lot of the guys that were playing. So I, I'm constantly going, just me doing that, I learned something. I'm always wanting, I'm, I'm afraid to try to use some new art, new musician on a session where the budget's really tight because I, one guy that chokes or girl that chokes can cost you a lot of money. And so I'm, I always use this, I pretty much cast my, my musicians based on the artists who I know they like, who I think fits their music. But uh, I'm so glad I did that little uh, experiment with this art, this singwriter's artists because I learned something. I sort of stole a few ideas from uh, from a couple of the songs. I was going, I'll use that on something I'm going to do in the future. But I think in this town, it's, it's the comfort zone works for me in this town. I went to L.A. and did something recently and had somebody hire the musicians. I took a couple of players, Tom Bukovac, with me and Paul Franklin just for my comfort zone and it, it made it work for me but you know when you're when you're being creative i think you've got to make it i think you got to be you got to have blind faith and you got to just go for it but at the same time you also have got to have something that makes you feel that you can pull it off uh because there's nothing worse or demoralizing than wasting your time working on something that you knew was good, and it didn't turn out great. Oh, yeah. And then there's something demoralizing when you cut, when I was at MCA, I cut records on a couple of artists that the promotion department never put out that were big hits for other people. So I think my strength has always been about songs. The song is the key and the, how it's presented is your is, as a producer it's your job to make sure that it's presented the way the songwriter in the case of a songwriter that sings like like jeff or even craig wiseman i mean he, he's not an artist but he's a killer singer when i cut believe on ronnie dunn we had a hell of a time coming up to the the level of craig's demo which was a mess but boy it spoke but the way he does it it yeah. spoke to us you know yeah. And uh, we, we cut that song based on the way he, it was presented. So if you picked up anything out of what I just said, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to ask another question, but I thought if anybody has questions for these guys, why don't you queue up right here and I'll hand you my mic when I'm done. So if anybody has any questions, I'm not sure if you guys have a mic, but I can, I'm happy to give my mic to anybody who wants to ask questions. Okay, can I do one last tw of 10 course. seconds? Just, oh yeah, no, no rush, the, we have a blur, little more time. I just want to get it started. Okay, on the blur of the whole thing, I think <laughs> 10 years ago, even, of course 20 years ago, but 10 years ago, there was a huge difference. I really think there's no blur now, but I, I feel like 
Atlanta and Na Nashville is such an amazing, it, 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 what, the, what's happened musically here in Nashville, it's almost taken over New York and LA. Uh, um, I mean, I'm not saying that it's, they're ranked, but um, it's amazing how um, it's so blurred, the lines are blurred here. And anybody can be from any genre now and fit into anything that happens here and it can end up in any place here. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. I, got one, I got one more thing I want to tell. This is so funny. You know, the, the musicians in Nashville and the engineers in Nashville are world class. They're good as anybody in the entire world. I did uh, Lionel Richie's last record four years ago called Tuskegee. And it, we were cutting duets with all the country stars uh, with him, you know, stuck on you and all night long, all that stuff. And I was going, why would you do that? But then I'm glad I did it because it ended up selling a lot of records. It was a great record. But his manager at the time, Randy Phillips, who is no longer his manager, Randy managed Usher and he managed Lionel. So Randy called me and said, who's your arranger on these tracks you're going to cut on Lionel? I said, oh, I don't have an arranger. It's going, it's going to happen on the floor. These musicians, it happens on the floor. He said, that's not going to work. Lionel is like a jet pilot. He likes a flight plan before he takes off. I said, okay, man. I didn't listen to him. I called Dan Huff and everybody. I said, have you ever hired an arranger for tracks? They said, no, man. We hire arrangers for string arrangements. <laughs> But no, I've never. I said, okay, good. So when Lionel walked in, I said, Lionel, your manager told me I had to have arrangements written, but we don't do that here in town. These guys are too good. And he said, well, that scares the shit out of me, but let's do it. And, and as we were doing the sessions, he said, man, this is fun. I haven't done this since the Commodores. He said, thanks for sticking up, sticking up for this. He said, this is a lot of fun, man. Because, you know, all those guys, would listen to the original record, pull the certain licks from a record. If you do What a Fool Believes by Michael McDonald, you gotta do that, get that piano part. But you can put other things around it. So the, these players I hired uh, were so good and it was so much fun for Lionel. And it, it, it just still makes people realize how much Nashville is such, it's, it, it's a melting pot. All these musicians here and engineers and studios know in order to compete with New York and Los Angeles, we got to be as good, if not better. And guess what we are? This, this town is like, is really, I think with all these new hotels we're building, hopefully we'll get a Grammys here soon because the Grammys should do a TV show here in this town because we are the hip town in town in Nash, excuse me, we're the hip town in the United States. Forgive me, I only graduated from high school. You can tell by all the real estate prices going up so much around here. <laughs> God, can you imagine being in the studio with these guys? Endless stories, I mean, we could go on all day. I do wanna make sure that we get time for any questions. I don't see anybody queued, okay, we have a couple queued up, so let's turn it over to you guys and we'll have to answer pretty quickly because I did get the five minute warning, okay? Five minute warning. Hello, great panel, guys. Uh, I work with a foundation, and I'm part of a foundation that helps people with Alzheimer's and dementia regain their memories using that soundtrack we all carry around in our heads. What does it take to write one of those type of songs that people will remember and will resonate with them forever, no matter what condition they're in? I think sometimes um, um, you got you to gotta just write it and not say, I have to write a song about Alzheimer's. You got to try to write the song and, and tap into the emotion that you're trying to hit and, and not try so hard to capture a, a thing because you can drive yourself crazy trying to do that. But I've always found that uh, or there, if, there's, a song, there's a song I wrote years ago called My Wish for a group called Rascal Flats. And I just wrote that song. I wasn't trying to, I wrote it for my daughter actually. But all these years later, I get all these organizations that want to use the song. Um, you know what I mean? Put the song behind what their what their campaign is, stuff like that. But I think you just ultimately have to have to write it. You have to just keep crafting songs. And and like I said when we first started, you hope that one thing comes through you that one day that just triggers that right lyric that just falls the right way. You got to write a million of them to get one. I'm telling you. But but you do it. You just do it. 
what I hear you saying is tapping into a feeling, an emotion, maybe more than a thought or something that makes logical now, sense. I say, I say it's God, which whatever you believe, but I, I just, I know that every now and then, if I, if I write 500 songs in a year, which sometimes I'll do, I might write one or two where I feel this inspiration coming through me that's out of my head that just guides me and, and I just know how to do what I'm doing with the pencil or my fingers on the keyboard, right? And I just let it take me and I, I stay in that subconscious and I think you have to stay in that subconscious and you just have to try to write the truth and it turns into the song that represents that thing that you're trying to represent, you know? How Alzheimer's, I was talking about right. writing a song that a person would feel so deeply that they would remember that. Even yeah, I, I, I get that. You're not talking specifically about Alzheimer's, but I just meant like specifically the feeling itself. You know what I mean? It's uh, to me, it's like you just have to, you, you just have to let that thing tap in, and 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 if you're doing it with co-writers, find some great co-writers. <laughs> for for whatever your role is in the industry, how many of you have felt that kind of inspiration? or that knowing that emotion. I mean, really raise your hand, because this shows that it's all possible. Hit making is possible for everybody in this room. It's not just the ones that have had the track record, because it can be the new people, the fresh blood, you know, that can bring renewed inspiration. So I just want you, literally it was at least 90% of you guys have felt that. So that means it's possible for everyone. And, and what about what about crafting? Because you're doing that too, right? You're doing a little crafting too, right? Yeah. I mean, right? <laughs> all right, I will end up with you, okay? Thank you guys for uh, speaking today. It's been very inspirational hearing from you guys. Uh, my simple question, you guys may have already touched upon it, was what have been some of the biggest mistakes you guys made that you learned the most from? Well, I think when I first became an A&R person, I didn't think about, I thought about what was happening right now, and I was pitched artists that I look back on that and I was thinking, if I, don't, if I thought the way I think now, I would have seen through that example. Dwight Yoakam, Sherman Halsey brought him to MCA in 84 and said, man, he is killing them in clubs in Texas, in LA. Chicks dig him. And I thought, he, he sang through his nose and that bugged me. Bad mistake. The, the other one was Garth Brooks first came to town and Bob Doyle was pitching him around. He was going around town so he met with me and Jimmy Bowen. Jimmy Bowen pretty much trained me and uh, we went, Garth came to Bowen's house and, and Jimmy Bowen said, well Garth, who is Garth Brooks? And Garth said, I'm a little Kiss. I'm a little George Jones. I'm a little James Taylor. I'm a little Bob Seger. and a little bit of Garth Brooks. And so Bowen, we shook our heads and he got up and left and Bowen said, what do you think about him? I said, I think he's full of shit. <laughs> and then about six months later, he's on Capitol and he has that show from Cowboy Stadium where he comes flying in to the stadium on a rope on fire. <laughs> and I said, hey Bowen, he was telling us the truth. <laughs> you know, so I, I remember not, not <laughs> looking too superficially and uh, I remember when I signed Patty Loveless Bowen thought that she was too much of a hick but her voice was so authentic and so vulnerable and I just I, I would put I put my job on the line for her and I look back on that going man was I so smart because she still was never a superstar but she is revered by Miranda Lambert, by a lot of people, because she she sort of created her own little path. And then Steve Earle, same way, and Lyle Lovett. I remember when I signed Lyle Lovett, the A&R person at RCA at the showcase says, who's gonna play that? I said, somebody will. Mm. You know, and I, I just, I believed in what I saw, and so I started believing in myself. And, and But I only, I learned that from, I, I guess you can tell, I love this business and I love, I'm not a songwriter, I'm an adequate musician, but I'm a creative person and I love, like what hurts the most, somebody asked me to list the 10 best records of all time oh. for CMT 
that's really hard to do. But you start thinking, you, know, you start out with like, what hurts the most? The dance. Uh, it gets really hard. You start getting down to maybe. Uh, it, it gets, you, you start thinking, no, that's not good enough. Like Chicken Fried by Zach Brown, which I wanted to hate. Then I went, I hate, I love this song. Before you hear it, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, what were great records, and it usually means what was a great song, what was a great production, what spoke. And uh, I, I, I really am still in the business because now it's the young man's world, and I'm back in the business for music. In fact, I got a 13 year old girl riding with Jeffrey Steele right now. Yes that nobody believes in except me and her fans. I think she's the next big thing. And even if I fail, I think she'll still be a superstar. But I, I want to be a part of that journey with her because I want to be around people that inspire me. Because as long as I'm inspired, I'll keep working. You know, I, I'm not retired. I'm retired by default, like the guy in the Publix. <laughs> Back in the day, man, I'm going to be back there again soon, I promise. I, Thank you so can much. I get on that uh, really, really quick. Okay. 30, se 30 <laughs> seconds. I just want to say, biggest mistake I ever made was waiting too long, trying to be the best, the, the second best Merle Haggard or the second best uh, Robert Plant for a lot of years of my career. And I just finally got to a place where, I, you know, or trying to be the second best Gary Burr when I first came to Nashville. <laughs> Gary Burr, the man right there. And, and I, I, I just decided to be the best Jeff Steele that I could be. And, and me sitting up here and you guys sitting out here, there's no difference. I'm sitting up here just because I, I was who I was. I figured out a way to become who I was. You gotta be who you are. Who you are and the sound that you make, the thing that you make, the stamp that you make, is what makes you what you are. It's, it's, it's what's gonna catapult you the most in this business with these hit songs. Well, it's undeniable Sorry. that you guys are all inspirational. I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. I hope everybody enjoyed it. If you do want to get in touch with me and to these guys, you can email me at chandra at glowmarketing.com. C-H-A-N-D-R-A at glow, G-L-O-W, marketing.com. Have a great show, everyone.